wellness and health. Everything about us is all about you. Okay, I want to welcome everyone here today to the Code Stroke Management module, and this module will help you as we process through and as we make that change from code strokes being handled um, specifically by the E5 and E4 nurses to the intensive care units managing their own code strokes. So first off, I want to start talking a little bit about First, I want to start out talking just with some basic information about stroke. And we know each year there's almost 795,000 strokes um, just within the United States. Stroke is the fifth leading cause of death. When I first started doing this, we were the third. Uh, and we've gone down to the fifth. And we actually got overtaken in the fourth position by COPD and down to fifth position by unintentional deaths, gunshot wounds, accidents, that type, that type of thing. However, stroke is still the leading cause of disability in the United States. We know with appropriate and quick recognition and quick action on behalf of the staff and the, the general layperson that we can hopefully reduce disability by um, 2020. We have the American Heart Association has a goal of reducing it by at least another 25 to 30 percent the number of deaths. I will tell you that twice as many women die from stroke than dies from breast cancer and that's a little known fact that, that people are aware of. And also, someone has a stroke about every 40 seconds, and about every four minutes, someone actually dies of a stroke. So we're going to talk about, just a little bit with our objectives, what, what the intent of this program is, and that's to identify treatment and interventions for ischemic and hemorrhagic strokes. We want to identify stroke syndromes and symptoms that mimic stroke, and then we want to be able to identify activase uh, with the inclusion and exclusion criteria, and we'll really go into a little bit more detail about that as we move on. So an initial code stroke management, of course, is controlling vital signs, confirming that the event is a stroke, determining the ideology of that event, and then preventing any kind of decompensation and medical complications, and of course, beginning the appropriate treatment. And that's the key, beginning the most appropriate treatment that we can for the patient. All of us have heard about reversible ischemia, and that is actually the penumbra. And the penumbra is the zone of reversible ischemia that's around the infarct and that salvageable brain tissue that we want to try to save. And the best way to think about that is think of an apple. And the core of the apple is actually where the stroke occurs and you can see the infarction itself. And then the area around the apple is like the pulp of the apple and that's called the penumbra. And we have 32,000 brain cells that die every second that that penumbra is not perfused. So that early recognition, early detection, and early treatment, that is why we want to save that penumbra. One of the best ways to save the penumbra is keeping the blood pressure up, and we'll go into blood pressure parameters as we get through the program. And of course, things that damage the penumbra is hypotension. Think about that, we're not getting blood into that area, and if we drop that blood pressure even lower, that's, low, that's less perfusion that the brain is getting. Seizures also damage the penumbra, hyperglycemia damages the penumbra, and fever damages the penumbra. And all of those are things that we will talk about and how we're going to control those. This is a copy of your in-house code stroke algorithm. And once you begin handling your own code strokes, you will actually have a ring, and I think everybody's pretty much decided it'll go on the crash cart or above the crash cart. And on that ring will also include your in-house code stroke algorithm and some other documents that will be laminated so you can have those for quick review. But again, all of this is always on the internet. And we've broken down roles and responsibilities just to kind of make it a little bit clearer. But it is always a good reference tool for you to go back to in the event that, what do I do next? You know, what am I going to do next? So we know the universal recognition sign for stroke is fast and everyone should have their lanyard on their badge that says um, the fast, the face, arm, speech, and time, the face, we want to look, see, is there a smile, if it's crooked, as the patients describe it. 
We ask patients to put their arms out in front of them to see if one actually drifts. We ask them to say a simple sentence. Sometimes you may not want to remember to say, you can't teach an old dog new tricks, but you can ask the patient, do you know where you are? What is your name? What did you have for breakfast? Just looking for inappropriate words or slurred words, and of course, T is for time. Not only do we want patients to know to call 911 if they're out in the community, but us, as a healthcare facility, we have, we have time parameters that we'll discuss also and how quickly things have to get done and how quickly we have to move through that process. So currently, what happens when you have a code stroke? You call that code stroke, it's paged overhead, and the patient's nurse will call the physician to initiate the code stroke protocol orders. So just calling the code stroke doesn't automatically give you permission to initiate the code stroke protocol orders. You have to get a physician's order for that. The stroke team is paged, and during the day, usually myself or the director of Five East or the nurse manager of Five East will respond. After hours, a phone, the phone goes off all the time on E4 and E5, and a nurse from E4 or E5, specifically E5, will always respond. Your house supervisor should respond after hours, or at least they do get that page. Also, it pages radiology, and it pages the lab, and it pages the IV room in the pharmacy. And that, that is paged so that in the event that TPA has to be mixed, the pharmacy will be looking for that order as they, um, as they hear that page going off. So the team members report to the patient's rooms. It lets radiology know to clear a table. And again, pharmacy prepares to receive the activase or alteplase order if that patient is getting that. The new process is all the same except the ICU team will be your own code stroke team. So basically what we were doing, when we were sending a floor nurse into a critical care area to do an NIH stroke scale and a dysphagia screen based in a neuro assessment for a patient. A neuro assessment of your patient that you've been caring for. So we just felt like it would be better for the patient if the person during the neuro assessment was the person that had been caring for the patient. Number one, because they know that patient and number two, if there's any major changes, they can communicate those changes to the admitting physician. So everything else stays the same. The only difference is that the nurse in ICU, and it's in your own specific unit, will be handling your, your code stroke. We have developed a code stroke checklist, and basically what we did was we took the algorithm and we converted it to a check sheet. And these will be laminated, and these will also be on your room. And as you see, it's just step by step what to do, just in case you kind of get you forget the process, or you you think, oh gosh, did I do something, or did I not do something? What else do I need to do? This this goes all the way through from your fast exam all the way down to if you if end up giving um, alteplase or activase to that patient. And one thing I do want to mention, you'll hear me calling it alteplase in the place of TPA, and that's been an FDA regulation or, or uh, ruling. As of two months ago, they recommended that we remove TPA from all of our documentation tools. So you'll see it gradually fade out. For a while, we'll keep all to place and TPA in parentheses, but eventually all you will see is all to place because somewhere, some, somebody has given T of case in the place of TPA. So order sets, once you have now you've called your code stroke, you've called your doc, and the doc says initiate the code stroke in-house, you will you go to your order set, you type in stroke, you hit enter, and once you hit enter, this is what comes up. And it does look a little confusing, but believe you me, it, we have reduced the number of stroke orders significantly since I've been here. So you're going to be looking for yellow pizza boxes, and the yellow pizza box that you're going to be concerned with is that code stroke in-house, and that will initiate all of your code stroke orders. Now, the physician may say, you don't need to order the whole order set. All I need is, the, is a head CT. Well, you don't want to go in and order a regular head CT. Again, you would do it just like this. You would type in stroke, hit enter, and you would go to the radiology code stroke. And I'll show you why. When you hit the radiology code stroke, it actually orders a CT stroke brain less than eight hours of onset. This is the only way that you can order that head CT. That specific head CT alerts the radiologist that he has 25 minutes to read that head CT. 
So we want to make sure that we always order the appropriate head CT. And sometimes even once you take the patient down to CT, if the wrong or incorrect order gets put in, they will change that to the correct um, CT brain. So if they just want the radiology code stroke, this is basically what gets ordered, is that CT stroke brain in less than eight hours. So let's talk a little bit about stroke mimics, because as we move through and we're processing this code stroke and we're looking at the patient and we're trying to figure out what is going on, there are some things that actually mimic strokes, right? Hypoglycemia. And yes, we do go to code strokes sometimes and we get there and the blood sugar will be 25. But we'd always rather err on the side of caution and call that code stroke and then find out the blood sugar is 25 because we can treat that blood sugar. We don't want to treat it super, super aggressively because you don't want a, a hyperglycemic brain because just because the patient has hypoglycemia now doesn't mean that they can't also be having a stroke. And then you have seizures with that post ictal state. The seizure is kind of like the chicken or the egg. Did the seizure cause the stroke or did the stroke cause the seizure? So your physician, your, physician, your admitting physician will 99.9% .9 of the time refer those patients to neurology before they make that decision for TPA. We'll talk about seizures being a relative contraindication um, in the old, in the American Heart Association guidelines, but the FDA has actually removed that to just a, uh, not a complete exclusion, and we'll talk about that in just a minute. But patients with seizures can have what? Todd's paralysis. So they can have stroke-like symptoms and then you get that CT back and the CT is negative and within 24, 48 hours those symptoms will have dissipated completely and then they'll have a positive EEG. But we don't know that to begin with. So we may end up giving patients sometimes TPA and then find out that it was just a seizure to begin with. And research has shown that patients that are not complicated that receive TPA and really didn't need it in the case of a seizure patient receiving TPA, research has shown that these patients do not have near the complications or bleed rate that a, an acute stroke patient would. And then migraines also is a stroke mimic. Think about a migraine depending on where that migraine occurs in the brain. Once that migraine hits, if it hits an area that controls say your, your motor activity or your sensory, you can also have stroke-like symptoms or stroke mimics. And then tumors and abscesses, a lot of times you'll see those, but if you do a good history on the patient and you know what's going on with your patient, you'll find out that the patient had some problems. Maybe they've been having headaches for weeks and weeks and weeks. Or maybe they have uh, cancer with metastasis. So looking at that history can kind of help you delineate whether it was a tumor or an abscess. And then a subdural hematoma. Subdural hematoma presents like a stroke but it actually isn't a stroke. Those are caused by trauma. So they don't get coded out as strokes, but we do treat them like hemorrhagic strokes in that they don't get antithrombotics and they don't get uh, the anticoagulants because of course it is a bleed in the brain, but it's not actually a stroke because it is trauma. And then a conversion reaction or a disorder. Yes, we do have those patients frequently and yes, some of them have actually gotten TPA. And again, it falls into that same category that patients don't have adverse reactions to that medication. And then metabolic conditions. There's numerous metabolic conditions like an encephalopathy that could actually mimic a stroke. And again, that's where we, knowing our patients, particularly with your critical care nurses, you all know what your patients have, you know what you're treating those patients for, you know their lab work. So you're certainly in a better condition to evaluate those patients than someone from the floor just walking up cold turkey. So the code stroke principles under that initial code stroke management, we talked about those just a minute ago, but the main one, of course, is do no harm. We want to avoid giving glucose unless that blood sugar is less than 60. And what I always recommend is don't pump them up with a whole amp of D50. You can start off with a half an amp, see how the patient recovers. Because it's always easier if their blood sugar doesn't come up to give them a little bit more D50 than if you've pumped them full of, whole, full of a whole amp of D50, now all of a sudden you've got a blood sugar of three or 400. Guess what, the patient's not any better. Oh, we might need to give them TPA. And a hyperglycemic brain with TPA can cause a lactic acidosis of the brain. It also, hyperglycemia, decreases the efficacy of TPA. So we want to be very cautious with those patients 
um, when we're treating those with the glucose if we still suspect that may be having a stroke. And again, avoid treating hypertension. This would be in your ischemic stroke patients. An ischemic stroke patient's blood pressure can be as high as 220 over 120 according to the guidelines. Of course, we won't keep it that high. Sustain, sustain that, that blood pressure. However, over the first 24 hours, we are not as aggressive as treating blood pressure because hypertension is a physiological response to an ischemic stroke. And why do we want to do that? As we talked earlier about that penumbra, we're trying to reperfuse that penumbra. So we want to keep that blood pressure up. We always teach our EMS partners, don't ever treat hypertension in the field. Wait until that patient comes into the DC and let's see what's going on with them. Preventing aspiration pneumonia, that's why we do our dysphagia screen, and we'll talk about that in a little bit more detail. Nothing by mouth until that dysphagia screen is completed. We know dysphagia increases the risk of mortality by 30%, sometimes up to 50%, depending on what research you're looking at. So it's something as simple as a water test to clear those patients. Just because it might not have been done in the EC, doesn't mean that it doesn't need to be done. We always need to do it. And even if we can't find it in the chart, it's not going to hurt that patient for us to give them a few spoonfuls of water because patients can breathe through those couple of teaspoons of water, but they can't through the fried chicken that we know their families a lot of times will bring them. Avoiding hypoxia. We only treat hypoxia if it's less than 95%. So if a patient has an O2 sat or room air of 98%, we don't need to flop oxygen on them. That's just another irritant and another way to increase somebody's blood pressure because how many times do we see patients sitting there picking at their oxygen tubing and it really irritates them. So unless that O2 sat on room air is less than 95%, we don't need to treat hypoxia. There's no research out that shows hyperventilating a patient like we used to do years ago increases um, better or improves better outcomes for those patients. And then IV fluids, always, always, always normal saline only. If you ever have a patient that comes up to you into the unit, or if that patient is in the unit now and they're getting D5W and you suspect that patient's having a stroke or you just called a code stroke on them, we need to take that D5 down or anything with dextrose in it, take it down and hang some normal saline until we figure out what's going on with those patients. And then of course, initiating those standardized stroke orders, we looked at those a, bit, a second ago, but making sure that we've initiated the right orders because within those orders embedded are our nursing interventions. And the nursing interventions are the, one, are the things that are going to keep us out of trouble. They're the ones that's going to improve patient outcomes. They have our blood pressure parameters. They talk about the aspiration, talking about our vital signs and neuro checks, how often we need to be doing those. So you want to make sure you have the appropriate order set initiated so that we can begin the appropriate stroke workup. With your acute ischemic stroke patient, we have several treatment or interventions that are available. Of course, the time-sensitive ones are our IVTPA or Alteplase. The FDA approves it up to three hours. In 2009, the American Heart American Stroke Association produced a paper that said the bleed rate from three to four and a half hours goes from 6.4% to 6.7%. So there wasn't a huge increase taking it up to that other hour and a half. However, there's more uh, exclusion criteria for that three to four and a half hours and we'll go over that. Endovascular interventions, these are certainly opportunities that we have for our patients, particularly our surgical patients, someone that may be in STICU or someone that may be in CBICU. Just because we can't give them TPA doesn't mean that they might not be eligible for some type of endovascular intervention. And then our wake-up strokes. Those are probably the most common. Those patients that come in that went to bed fine and they woke up with their stroke. And there are some studies going on uh, here, even here in the state of Georgia where they're actually um, studying wake-up strokes and doing interventions and that sort of thing. So, um, arrival to the appropriate health care facility and when was that last known time well when we're looking and when we're when we're looking at those patients and when we're thinking about when we call that code stroke that's probably one of the most important things when was the last known time well not the discovery of symptoms the discovery of symptoms was when you looked at the patient and you were like oh wow I think this patient might have had a stroke that's not that's important but what's even more important was when did we last see that patient normal and unfortunately for our patients in the unit, a lot of them already, may already have some other deficits. It may be somebody that's been on the ventilator for three or four days and we've taken them off and now they can't talk. Well, can they not talk because they've had a stroke or can they not talk because they've been intubated for three or four days? 
Again, that's where using our critical thinking skills, and it doesn't hurt to call a code stroke and get a patient evaluated. Always erring on the side of caution. So these are our golden hour times. The old time is on the right. This was the clock that we used, and historically this is the clock that's been used forever. Um, door to needle time was 60 minutes, and that was your target stroke on a roll through the American Heart American Stroke Association. We had 25 minutes to get a CAT scan. We had 20 minutes to get it read. We had 60 minutes door to needle. So from the time that patient walked in the door, or from the time that we call that initial code stroke, we had 60 minutes to get all of our workup done, evaluate that patient, and determine whether they need TPA and get that bolus in in 60 minutes. Target stroke honor roll elite came out through the American Heart American Stroke Association, and now our door to needle time is becoming 45 minutes. So the clock on the left actually gives us an opportunity to readjust those times. So we have 20 minutes to get our CT complete. We have 35 minutes to actually get all of our CTs read and reported back and our lab work done if we needed any lab work, and then a 45 minute door to needle, and then 60 minutes to determine whether that patient may need some type of intervention. So times are changing and we are looking at our door to needle in 45 minutes or less. The new target stroke honor roll elite is that you get at least 50% of your patient, excuse me, 25% of your patients in 45 minutes or less, and 75% of your patients in 60 minutes or less. So ischemic strokes, how do we know we want to treat with IV uh, alteplase or TPA? What's the number one thing we have to have? We have to have a head CT. And that head CT has to be negative. And negative for what? What are we looking for? We're looking for a bleed. Do they have an intra a cerebral bleed? Do they have an intraventricular bleed? Do they have a, a subarachnoid hemorrhage? Are there other major signs of infarct? Have they already infarcted the whole left hemisphere of their brain? If they have a huge infarct, you will generally not give TPA because we know that patient's going to have a bad outcome. And plus, if it's already showing up on your head CT, then we really have to kind of reevaluate when that last known time well was. Blood pressures with our uh, alteplase. Initial blood pressure has to be 185 or one, over 110 or less. And then once that alteplase is started, blood pressure has to be maintained at or below 180 over 105. General rule is we'll treat patients with labetalol 10 to 20 milligrams times two. If the blood pressure has not gone down or if it goes down and doesn't stay down, at that point we'll go ahead and hang a cardiac drip. It's not uncommon to, ha to have that cardiac drip hung prior to TPA or alteplase administration, or we may have to hang it during alteplase administration. Anything we need to do to get that blood pressure down. This is your TPA or alteplase inclusion exclusion criteria form. This is actually located on the intranet. We as nurses do not make the decision whether to give alteplase or not give alteplase. However, as part of a code stroke team, it's our responsibility to know some of the inclusion exclusion criteria because we're calling physicians on the phone in the middle of the night and it's, a good, it's good to have in your report things that may exclude those patients for reasons that they may be a candidate. Because remember we said that when you call a code stroke, it doesn't automatically initiate a neurology consult. The neurologist has to be consulted by the physician on call or whoever's caring for that patient. So again, knowing that information um, is very, very helpful. I've just kind of highlighted some of the reasons that um, based on where your unit is, of course in neuro ICU, if that patient is suggestive of a subarachnoid hemorrhage and all the ICUs uncontrolled high blood pressure and CBICU or STICU, major surgery or trauma within the previous 14 days or any type of GI or urinary tract hemorrhage within the last 21 days, those would certainly be automatic exclusions for patients. So again, it's not the nurse that's making that call, it's us being knowledgeable about how to screen those patients so that when we call the physician, we can give them the most appropriate report that's out there. So this is just a little breakdown. And if you'll notice in red are the most common reasons that we don't administer alteplase here at our hospital. 
Again, the significant head trauma or prior stroke in the previous three months. History of intra, uh, cerebral hemorrhage or aneurysm, an ABM or brain tumor. Recent intracranial or intraspinal surgery. Of course, we know that would be applicable to our neuro ICU patients. A sustained blood pressure. Even if we have that pressure greater than 185 over 110 and we can't get it down and we've tried everything and we're like maxed out on cardine, then we cannot give that patient uh, all to place. Of course, any kind of active internal bleeding or bleeding dialysis, dialysis or where the platelet counts are less than 100,000, that would exclude that patient. We talked just a minute ago about a CT that shows a huge, huge infarction because we know those patients are not going to have good outcomes and it puts them at a higher propensity to bleed. And then the current use of any kind of direct thrombin inhibitors or 10A inhibitors, all of your NOACs, if they've had any kind of NOAC within the last 48 hours, neurology will not administer all to place to those patients. And why? Because it's not like your Coumadin where we can draw an INR. We can't get a, a bleeding time on patients that are on NOACs unless it gets sent out and it takes generally two days to get those back. So as a, as a general rule, anyone on a NOAC that's been on a NOAC or had one, uh, taken one in the last 48 hours, we will not administer all to place. Now we know with Pradaxa there is the new Praxvine, which is supposed to be the reversal agent for Pradaxa. However, when they did their studies, they did not do their studies on patients that would be eligible for all to place. So at this point, that is kind of a, a mute point for uh, evaluating patients for all to place. And then patients on anticoagulant therapy, if the INR is greater than 1.7, we would not give all to place. Just because a patient is on heparin, a heparin drip, or just because a patient is on Coumadin, doesn't mean that they may not, that they would not be eligible for all to place. It's based on what their INR is. So say you had a patient that you started a heparin drip on two hours ago, and now suddenly the patient has an abnormal speech or they have a left or right sided weakness, that patient could possibly still be eligible for all to place. We would have to draw a stat PT, PTT and INR and see what that is. And that's part of your stroke protocol if the physician chooses to implement the whole protocol. There's only one lab test that's required for all to place administration unless the patient is on anticoagulation therapy and that's a D-stick. A blood sugar and you can do it through you know through a D stick. So that is the only blood test that's that you have to have unless that patient has some type of um, bleeding diathesis or on anticoagulant or anticoagulation therapy. Otherwise the D stick and the blood sugar is the only thing that we need to know. There's some relative exclusions for less than three hours and relative exclusions mean that we may or may not choose to administer all to place. The number one is only minor or rapidly improving stroke symptoms that clear spontaneously. Let me just talk about this for a minute because we are participating in a Marist research project here at Medical Center of Addison Health through the American Heart Association and the University of Miami. And we are actually tracking these patients that have low NIH scores, NIH scores less than four, that did or did not get all to place. So this is technically been removed by the FDA as an exclusion in the new literature for all to place. We now look at what the patient's deficit is. And I like to give an example of, say we have a 45 year old gentleman that's an attorney, three kids, sole supporter for the family, he comes into the hospital, possible stroke, and he can't speak. So his NIH, because he's mute, is going to be a 2 to a 3. So that's a low NIH score. He only has that deficit, but that guy would not be able to make a living anymore if he couldn't speak. So we look at what the deficit actually is. So we're now leaning more towards treating the deficit, not necessarily treating the number. What a novel concept. We're treating the patient, not treating the paperwork. So. That, are, that is some changes um, that we are looking at and that we are studying across the country. Another thing that I want to mention while we're talking about this is if you get a patient from the emergency room and that patient came in with a potential stroke and that patient has come to your intensive care unit now, 
maybe because of hypertension, for whatever reason, they're in the ICU, and their NIH has gone back to zero. So they're back at baseline. Two or three hours later, their symptoms return. Their last known time well starts all over again. So once that patient's NIH, or once they go back to what their baseline was, the clock starts ticking all over again. And that has happened several times in the DC where the patient would come in, they would have stroke-like symptoms. By the time they got out of CT, their symptoms would be dissipated, their NIH would be back to zero during the workup. Maybe they're in the ER for an hour or so during the workup, the symptoms return, then the clock starts ticking all over again. So the th same thing happens on the floor. Seizure at onset, I think we talked about that earlier. And then major sur surgery, serious trauma, uh, history of recent GI or urinary tract hemorrhage, and then a recent acute MI, specifically within the last three months, would be a relative exclusion. And by relative exclusion, we say, you know, we have to outweigh the benefits and the risks with these patients. Additional inclusion and exclusion criteria, remember I said earlier that we had some additional for that three to four and a half hours. The relative exclusion is, if the patient is over 80, they do not get all to place in that three to four and a half hours. If their NIH is greater than 25, they do not get all to place in three to four hours. If they're taking oral anticoagulants, no matter what their INR is, if they come in on Coumadin and they have an INR of 1.2, we still will not give it in that three to four and a half hours. And if that patient has a history of diabetes and a prior ischemic stroke, so their, their stroke may have been three or four years ago, but they're diabetic and they have a history of stroke, we will not give them all the place in the three to and four and a half hour mark. So you see this is great information and that sheet is kind of a cheat sheet for you. So when you call that physician, you can, you can relate to him, you know, this patient has a new onset of stroke-like symptoms, but they do have diabetes, we're at the three and a half hour mark, they have diabetes and prior ischemia, so they're not really gonna be a TPA can or all to place candidate. So once in the TPA will only be administered in the emergency department or in the intensive care unit. And everyone should have taken the Genentech online course for all to place administration, but we want to review that. So we know it's a weight based drug. It's 0 0.9 milligrams per kilogram, not to exceed 90 milligrams. But what, do we, what does it come in? It comes in a 100 milligram vial. It comes in a 100 milligram vial for, the, for one purpose, that it's a one to one ratio. So it makes life a whole lot easier. But we always, always, always will destroy at least 10 milligrams or 10 cc's you're going to discard. Once you get your max dose, 10% of that dose is a bolus that's given over one to two minutes. And then the remaining 90% is given as a continuous IV infusion over 60 minutes. When you, when you mix your alteplase, and you shouldn't have to mix it here uh, in-house, the pharmacy should mix it. However, it is in the PIXIS system in neuro ICU in the event that we ever need it in a quick emergency. If I'm there, I can mix it, or if you felt comfortable mixing it, you could. The pharmacy will always mix it for you. They will bring you your bolus and they will bring you your drip. But if we're getting close to the time and we need to get it mixed, then we need to do what we have to do. So it's always based on the weight. We talked about the bolus, we talked about the infusion. You wanna always have your, your infusion ready to go because you wanna bolus that patient and immediately start the infusion. Prior to that, when you mix it, always go ahead and pull out what you don't need because some goodwill person may come behind you and reset your, your pump and then you've given the patient too much. So you mix, you mix up your diluent, your powder, you withdraw at least 10% or 10% uh, 10 or whatever you need to discard. In this case, let's just say we're given 90 milligrams, you're gonna discard 10 cc's, then you're gonna draw out your nine milligrams, you're gonna have 81 milligrams or 81 cc's left in your bottle, and you're, you can set your pump. The Alta place is set in your critical care pump, or you can do 81 cc's at a rate of 81 cc's an hour, so it goes in over an hour. Once that is finished, you always hang 50 cc's of normal saline with the same tubing because you still have alteplase in your tubing. 
So you're going to hang a 50cc uh, saline bag, and it's going to go at the exact same rate that, in this case, the 81 cc's per hour. Because what happens if you don't do that? You're rebolusing the patient. So you want that last little bit to go in at the exact same rate that the alteplase went in. You always give alteplase through a dedicated line. You never piggyback it onto anything else. So things to remember, you may hear it called TPA, you may hear it called Alteplase, you may hear it called Activase, in some places call it RTPA. The pharmacy does mix it in-house, however it is in the Pixis in, in neuro ICU, so if you need it in an emergent situation. It's a weight-based drug, 90 milligrams is the max that you'll ever give, but it comes in that 100 milligram bottle. The patient receives no aspirin, heparin, or oral anticoagulation for 24 hours post TPA or alt place. This will, the, the positioning of the bed will depend on the physician. The guidelines say that we elevate the head 30 degrees to decrease inter, uh, cranial pressure, but in some cases the physician may want the head of the bed a little bit flatter depending on what the patient's blood pressure is running. These patients will always go to an intensive care unit for cardiac monitoring or any cardiac dysrhythmias. Blood pressure must be maintained at or below 180 over 105, just like we said earlier. If there's any change in neurological status that occurs during the infusion, you're going to stop that infusion. Stop it immediately. Um, agitation may be um, one of the signs and symptoms. We want to make sure we're looking in these patients' mouths. What is, you know, angioedema, we'll talk about that in just a second, and look for any type of bleeding. But if there's any neuro change, the first priority is to always stop the infusion, contact the physician, and obtain an immediate CAT scan. This is your Alteplase documentation flow sheet. And this should, if the patient comes up from the EC, this is the form that will come up with the patient. If the patient is a direct admit to your unit from another area, then they sh we should pull this sheet out and start it. Or if you give, or if you start Alteplase, then you need to download the sheet, or you can copy it from the paper that will the that you will have on your ring. It's every vital signs are Q15 minutes times the first two hours. So all this sheet needs to be filled out in its entirety. In the event that the patient goes to MRI or goes for any testing, and you're missing some vital signs, you just need to make a, a comment on the paper record itself. You can also comment in the chart, but it just makes it easier for us to see. Make a comment why those vital signs are missed. Patient gone to OR, patient gone to MRI, and then we can pick back up where we started with the vital signs. There are other treatment options that are available. Remember we talked earlier, we, talked, we just talked about the Alta place, but there are some Endovascular procedures, this is actually our endovascular suite that we have downstairs. The Mercy is, the Mercy and the Penumbra were the first ones, that's the one on the left. The newest ones are called Trevo or Solitaire, that's the one on the right. Looks kind of like chicken wire. They go in through the groin just like you do with a heart cath, thread that catheter up to the brain. They deploy the, the device, they let it sit for one to two minutes and then they pull back and they'll get the clot. This can be done up to eight hours and also depends on where the stroke is. I'm going to show you a couple of examples. So these are patients that happen to come in through the emergency department, but this doesn't always have to be the case. In the upper left hand corner what you're looking at is a CT perfusion. And if you see the purple area, the purple is actually the core of the stroke. Remember we talked about the core and the penumbra. The green is the penumbra. So in order to be eligible for an endovascular procedure, you want to see a mismatch. You want to see a bigger penumbra because that lets you know that you've got more area of the brain that you can actually save. So this particular person arrived at our facility with an NIH stroke scale of 17. We did um, start all to place on this patient. We sent the patient up to another facility for a thrombectomy, they did get full reperfusion. If you look at the picture on the right, the left picture is the before, the right picture is after. This patient was actually discharged a few days later with an NIH stroke scale of two.
she had a little upper, uh, left upper extremity weakness in the arm and ataxia in that arm. And she had a little over one inch clot that was retrieved. This particular patient, again, you can see the purple is the core, the green is the penumbra. So in this case, we had a mismatch volume of almost 150 cc's. So that was 150 cc's of brain that we could save. Patient arrived at Grady with an NIH stroke scale of 16. You can look at the before, look at the after. He had almost a three and a half inch clot went home with an NIH of three, with an anticipated discharge was only in the hospital for three days. And then the last one was a very recent patient that we had. She came in, actually her seven-year-old grandson found her and called the family. And this patient had an NIH stroke scale of 17. She had a, a CT that was consistent with a right MCA infarct. She was transferred, at, received uh, all to place. She was transferred to Grady. When she got to Grady, her NIH stroke scale was um, 20. So the all to place had not helped her that much. The CTA revealed a right ICA occlusion. They were able to, to get a full reperfusion with a TK score of three. That lets us know how well that perfusion is done. And the patient was discharged a few days later with an NIH stroke scale of two, with only a minor facial paresis and some mild dysarthria. And she actually had a six centimeter clot, two six centimeter clots removed. And you see her before and her after. So the patient not being eligible, when, we, when we're thinking about our code strokes, just they may not be eligible for that all to place, but we have to think, we have to kind of put our critical thinking cap on, and would this patient be eligible for some type of other procedure if they would qualify for that. One thing that we do have is a code stroke documentation tool. So when you call your code stroke, this is found in ad hoc. And when you click on when you click on the code stroke documentation tool, it populates, if you look on the right, it populates your NIH stroke scale, your dysphagia screen, it gives you a narrative note and a place for vital signs. So you're not having to go in and out of ad hoc and clicking each one. They're all right here on one tool. So you do your baseline NIH stroke scale when that code stroke is called. And your NIH stroke scale, it is an evidence-based stroke scale. It was actually created back in 1983. Um, in, during the NINS trial, they, they used this in 1995 when they, were using, when they were evaluating the severity of stroke patients. So it is an evidence-based. It's the only evidence-based and validated stroke scale besides the Glasgow Coma Scale. It detects changes in severity of the stroke, and it also measures neurologic function over time. It gives us a communication tool that we can use from shift to shift, from nurse to nurse. So we know if, if a patient has an NIH stroke scale of seven, and you come in at 7 p.m., and now suddenly that NIH stroke scale is 10, the, obviously the patient's getting worse. Or if you start out with a seven, you've given them all to place, and now they're down to a two, then we know that we've we've opened up some of that, um, we've revascularized some of that area of the brain. There's 15 components. It does take a little bit of time to do, but once you become accustomed to doing it all the time, you can go through it a lot more quickly. It's zero to 42 points. When we think about from a neuro standpoint of how patients are gonna do, generally zero to five are considered minor to mild disabilities, and those patients are probably gonna go home. Seven to 13 is a moderate disability, and they may end up in some type of inpatient rehab just for short term, two to three weeks. And then above 14 is a long-term disability. Um, those patients may end up in a nursing home or skilled nursing facility. And any increase of two to four points, I would say any increase in two points indicates a relevant change. So if you're evaluating your patient and you have a two point change in your NIH stroke scale, then what are you gonna do? You're gonna notify the doctor. Your dysphagia screen, you may hear it called your bedside swallow screen, your swallow screen. These are done, again, with all of our code strokes. It's very simple. You get a cup with a little water. I suggest you do not use a straw. And number one question, can the patient participate, yes or no? If, the, if it's no, then you don't have to move any further. 
anytime you get a no, it pretty much, you know that you, you're not gonna, uh, the patient has failed the dysphagia screen. So what's the next question? Can they manage their own secretions? Well, guess what? If they can't swallow their spit, they can't swallow whatever food we're gonna try to give them. And is their speech understandable, yes or no? Do they have a pharyngeal sensation? Do they have some kind of gag reflex? And can they swallow 60 cc's of water? I usually try to start out giving them a few teaspoons of water first to see how they do, and then give them a cup and let them drink it. Does the water drool out of their mouth? Do they cough? Do they tear? You know, we have to look for silent aspiration causes too. Do they do the turtle where they kind of do their neck, move their neck several times to kind of work that water down? Just use your common sense, use your critical thinking, and, and if you suspect that patient is gonna have trouble swallowing, because aspiration pneumonia is a, a big complication and have, carries a high mortality rate, go ahead and make those patients MPO until speech can come around and evaluate those patients. There's not a whole lot of patients in the middle Georgia area that can't go 24 hours without something to eat. So we can always start IV fluids on them and give them some normal saline until speech therapy can see them the next day. So will you ever get it right? We hope you will, but sometimes you feel like you have the worst job in the world. So now that we've called that code stroke and we've evaluated that patient, what are we going to do now? Where, where do we move from now? Okay, the, the who law is all over. What happens? So was the code stroke order set implemented? Did the doc just order the, the radiology code stroke or did he actually order the code stroke protocol? If he ordered the code stroke protocol, then you're going to start looking at what your nursing interventions are. How, how often do you do your vital signs and neuro checks? Does the patient have SCDs on? What about the aspiration precautions? Did we go back and do that dysphagia screen? Looking at what the blood pressure parameters are, lab orders. Unfortunately, sometimes lab orders get put in as nurse draws, and I know the unit does, does do all their nurse draws, but we have to think about on the floor as well. If an order was put in on the floor, it would be a lab draw, so then if the patient's transferred to the unit. So always look and see how your, lab, your labs were ordered. And then it was appropriate therapy ordered if it was, if we suspected it was a stroke. If they didn't use that code, that code stroke protocol and a stroke is suspected, then we need to call that physician and say, do you want us to initiate that code stroke order set? Again, because we're looking for those nursing interventions. So we want to prioritize our patient's needs with that neurological assessment, that baseline NIHSS and the Glasgow scale. We need to do a comprehensive assessment on those patients. We need to make sure if we're caring for those patients, we already know what that history is, the signs and symptoms that they had, when were their symptoms, what was the onset, what medications are the patients on, what comorbidities do those patients have. Have we gotten a full set of vital signs to include an O2SAT? We hopefully have already gotten our glucose. And then we want to kind of look at our patient history and our signs and symptoms. What's going on and what do we think? If they have used that order set, then we should anticipate that the doctors are going to order an echo or a swallow study. More than likely that patient will have an MRI and an old carotid ultrasound and some lab work and a lipid profile. Lipid profiles have to be drawn on acute stroke patients within the first 48 hours of the code stroke being called or within 48 hours of when they arrive to the hospital. So in the event that you got a code stroke patient from the EC and that patient came up, there wasn't a lipid profile ordered, the lab will keep blood for seven days. So we can always go ahead and order it off of blood work that was or blood that was drawn previously. And again, we start our discharge planning, right? Discharge planning begins on admission, and then we want to monitor for safety during and after all of our treatments. So those patients that don't get thrombolytic therapy, again, that blood pressure lowering is not recommended within the first 24 hours. We say blood pressure can be as high as 220 over 120. We don't consistently keep it that high. We generally keep it 160 to 180. But it is reasonable to lower that blood pressure, if necessary, by 15% within the first 24 hours. That's right out of the guidelines. And after the onset of stroke. And of course, monitor for any neurological deterioration. Because what happens when we drop that blood pressure? I always explain that to people, like the black garden hoses that are flat, when you turn the water on, they swell up. That's the same concept with the arteries in our brain. If we've got hypertension, then we've got blood that's just pumping through, pumping through, pumping through, 
and you've got those arteries that are enlarged, if we drop that pressure too quickly, it's like turning the water off on those black garden hoses, they collapse. The same concept happens in our brain, it collapses, so we lose perfusion in the brain. So that's why we want to monitor that blood pressure very closely. What medications was the patient taking at home? Did the doctor reorder every medication they were on at home? We want to look at that ourselves. And then what are the frequency of our vital signs and neurological assessments? Um, Antiplatelet therapy, this is one of our core measures, has to be uh, started by the end of hospital day two. We like to say within the first 24 hours, because if that patient is admitted at 2359 on Monday, then that medication has to be started no later than 2359 on Tuesday, and that's really 24 hours. So it's always best just to say antiplatelet therapy within the first 24 hours. And any kind of uh, history or, or recent episode or current episode of AFib or A-flutter, we may need anticoagulation therapy. Of course, depending on the size of the infarct, we may want to hold that for a few days, but that's usually left up to the neurologist if they suggest holding that. The larger the infarct, the more apt they are to hold anticoagulation therapy. And all stroke patients have to have cardiac monitoring for the first 24 or 48 hours. Again, with, without thrombolytics, we do that bedside dysphagia screen, and that is anything before anything goes in their mouth PO. And this is where you have to be very careful because if you go in and you do your dysphagia screen and then you give the patient medication, you need to make sure that when you go in to document your dysphagia screen, you don't just accept the date and time that's there. You would have to change that time to before, to prior to that PO medication. So if you did it at 8 a.m., you gave your medication, you scanned it at 08, you, you did your dysphagia at 08 a.m., and you scanned your, you scanned your med, and it scanned at 08, 08 01, and then you went back to document your dysphagia, and now it's 08 10, and you didn't back out that time, it looks like you gave the medication before you did the dysphagia screen. So it's kind of a catch-22. VTE prophylaxis has to be initiated on all admission patients for our stroke patients, both mechanical and pharmacological. So if you had a code stroke or if you've gotten a new stroke patient in and that patient wasn't on VTE prophylaxis, then we need to get that initiated. And that is mechanical and pharmacological. Of course, we said earlier, no anticoagulation if it's a huge, if it's a huge infarct, but we have to get the physicians to document that. They have to document against that. Same thing with our alteplase. We wouldn't give any kind of anticoagulation therapy for 24 hours for these patients. But of course we can put on SCDs and document it. PT, OT, and speech evaluations within 24 hours of admission. We want to monitor our blood glu glucose and keep that target less than 150. We already talked about that hyperglycemia. So we want to make sure we have a, a nice healthy brain that's trying to, to uh, heal itself. And then hyperthermia, any treatment for hyperthermia. We gotta keep that patient normal uh, thermic. So 37.5 degrees Celsius or anything below, uh, anything above 99.6, we're gonna treat now. And then again, discharge planning begins within 24 hours or on admission. So now we've got that patient that did get all to place. Whether we gave it in the unit with our code stroke or whether we're receiving that patient from the EC or say we're receiving a direct admit that came from another facility that got uh, all to place. Vital signs with your all to place patients are Q15 minutes. Um, you, want it, you want your neuro checks and vital signs at least 15 minutes before the bolus. So if, you, if it's more than 15 minutes, they need to be checked again before you administer your bolus. Then it's Q15 minutes times two hours, Q15 minutes times six hours, Q1 hour times 16 hours, and that will take you up to your first 24 hours. And of course, in the unit, you're gonna to continue to do Q1 hour vital signs and neuro checks until the physician orders differently. And what are we monitoring for? We're monitoring for a decline in the neuro status or worsening of symptoms. And we said this earlier, but it, it bears repeating. If you have any change in neuro status, the first thing you want to do is stop that infusion, call the doctor, get a stat head CT. We want to make sure we maintain that blood pressure at or below 180 over 105. And critical to the long-term thrombolytic success is not lowering that blood pressure too aggressively. So it's, it's kind of walking that fine line. We don't want it high, but we don't want it super low because we're trying to save our penumbra. 
So this is a patient with thrombolytic therapy. We know one of the major complications, a 6.4% chance of a hemorrhagic transformation. I put these two on because this is a patient that actually got alteplase that had a bleed. So you can see that patient had their MRI on 428 at, at 2048. And just within, what, three, seven hours, that's how much bleeding occurred, just within seven hours after the, the alteplase infusion. So patients can change very quickly. The neuro patients can change extremely quickly. Um, so that's something that we want to make sure we, we stay on top of. The other reaction or our to or potential complication for alteplase is angioedema. It actually occurs in about less than 5%. They're saying 1% to 2%. Again, it depends on the literature that you read. This is most common with patients that are on ACE inhibitors. However, that's not always the case. Think about an ACE inhibitor. They generally, their allergic reaction, they'll have a, that frequent cough. So part of your assessment is to look at these patients' mouths. We're checking for bleeding. We want to see if there's any type of, of swelling that's going on. The most, com the most common reaction time is 30 to 75 minutes post-infusion, but it can occur up to 24 hours post-infusion. I've seen one of these in person, and the patient was not on an ACE inhibitor, and it happened 12 hours post-infusion, and we ended up having to intubate the patient. So it's just something that you really have, we don't think about, but we really need to be very cognizant of and make sure that we check these patients frequently. Treatment is pretty common. It's Benadryl 50 milligrams IV, Zantac 50 milligrams IV, and some type of cortisone or um, prednisone IV. And we usually treat them Q4 to six hours times 24 to 48 hours. The other complication we talked about was the intracerebral hemorrhage. We wanna maintain or manage the primary injury. Some of the things to look for when you're evaluating your patient, you're doing your neuro checks, of course, is impaired level of consciousness. Is the patient, do they suddenly start vomiting? Do they have a severe headache? What's their blood pressure been running? What's their blood sugar been running? So we wanna to continue to support the ABCs. We wanna monitor that blood pressure and fever. We wanna prepare for intubation and protecting that airway if we have a huge bleed on those patients. And again, the blood pressure management, we talked about that. Cardine is the first choice on our acute ischemic stroke patients. And then any type of seizure management. The research does not show that a lot of times you'll prophylactically treat a patient for seizures. You will your hemorrhagic seizures, but not necessarily your ischemic stroke. I mean, your hemorrhagic strokes, but not necessarily your uh, ischemic strokes. You don't prophylactically treat for seizures unless it's a huge infarct and they're anticipating something. Again, we may have to use some type of reverse anticoagulation. Um, so just kind of be aware of that when you're talking to your physician or when you're evaluating where you are in your whole process. So these are safety measures that we would use post-code stroke on all of our patients or on any stroke patients that come in. Aspiration precautions, we talked about that, making sure we get that dysphagia screen. We know these patients are at a 50% increased risk of aspiration pneumonia when they are in the intensive care unit, any kind of fall precautions or seizure precautions, particularly within the first 24 hours. Um, skin precautions for infections, UTI, 60% have urinary incontinence or retention. We try to avoid Foley's if at all possible. It is not recommended to insert a Foley catheter or an NG tube within the first 24 hours after alteplase and preferably even not before alteplase. VTE and immobility, I think we talked about SCDs, getting these patients up and moving, getting them hydrated, starting that normal saline. Uh, stress ulcer prophylaxis and personal care measures, helping these patients with elimination, positioning, early mobilization. Therapeutic environment being uh, coordinating care, offering a quiet environment for our patients, something we know is not always the case in an ICU. Uh, reorientation and alternative means of communication. And then I briefly wanted to just review these performance measures for you. Um, we talked about those as we went through, but these are not only core measures, these are performance measures that we're judged on. These are measures that are all evidence-based. These are measures that have research behind them that show that if patients actually receive this therapy and we follow those stroke 
the code stroke protocol and we followed the stroke order sets that these patients had much better outcomes. The first is with an uh, ischemic stroke patient and a hemorrhagic stroke patient, VTE prophylaxis by the end of hospital day two. With our ischemic stroke, it would be mechanical and pharmacological. With our hemorrhagic, it would just be mechanical. SDK2, acute ischemic stroke patients, is antithrombotic therapy at discharge. So patients that go home, you may, and we do have patients sometimes that are discharged from the unit. That has happened, making sure that they are on antithrombotic therapy. Uh, patients with AFib, that they go home on some type of anticoagulation therapy, or the physician documents against it as to why not. SDK4, acute ischemic stroke patients who arrive at the hospital within 120 minutes, or that we call a code stroke zone within 120 minutes, their last known time well, and who IV uh, alteplase was initiated within 180 minutes. And then acute ischemic stroke patients for our SDK5 that receive the antithrombotic therapy by the end of hospital day two. We talked about the LDL, and actually that LDL now is, any, we treat anything above 70. It used to be 100, but the new guideline is LDL greater than or equal to 70. With STK7, the dysphagia screen, I think we've talked about that, making sure that that patient gets screened prior to anything by mouth. And then education, which can be done um, out on the floor, or if that patient is being discharged from the unit, we need to make sure that they receive educational material, like the All About Strokes book. And then if they have any kind of history of smoking, that they receive smoking cessation advice or counseling. And then rehabilitation services, that patients, all patients receive an evaluation for PT, OT, speech, or if they go back to baseline, the physician documents in the record, why not? Some of those are applicable to ICU and some are not, but it's, I think it's important that we know the whole picture when we're caring for the patient. So stroke pearls that I wanted you to take away today is with our acute ischemic stroke patients, we want to reperfuse early, 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 early. Identify any complications that that patient may have. We, of course, want to prevent any kind of another stroke. We want to prevent VTE, prevent infection. We want to promote early and safe mobilization. We want to encourage our patient and family in the whole recovery process, and while including them in the education for uh, signs and symptoms of stroke, and then encouraging them to become involved in any stroke support group. And we do have a stroke support group here at our hospital. This is contact information for myself, Teresa Ledrick, the director of E5, Tracy Garber, the nurse manager, and Dr. Matthew Smith, who is our stroke medical director. Okay. Navison Health. Everything about us is all about you.